I'm with Sandra. And so I'm really excited that they're able to do that and, and spend some time together. And uh, I'm also grateful for the opportunity to just bring the Word of God to you today. And, uh, you know, as I've thought about this particular message this morning and what God wants to accomplish, it would have been really easy on a sermon like this one to go a route of a lot of logistics and practical information. And I really, <laughs> I tried, Lord willing, I, th that's what's going to happen, but I've really tried to avoid getting too bogged down with too many details. Because I think the most important thing that could happen this morning in, in the church and in any one of our hearts is that God would do a work to change our hearts as we relate to him and as we relate to others. That he would show us the weaknesses in our life where we're, we're relating to others improperly or we're relating to Jesus, our Savior, improperly. And so that's really what I hope is accomplished this morning, and I, and I hope that your heart's prepared. I, I have no idea how your morning's gone. I hope it's been a good morning, but you may be stressed to the max. And so I just wonder if we could just take a moment and pray and just be in God's presence for just a second and prepare our hearts for his word. Well, dear Lord, we come before you this morning as your church, your body. Lord, we know and we are confident that you are present here with us. Jesus, that you're in this room and that you have a word that you want to speak to our hearts. And God, that that word is something that is meant to change our hearts to make us more like you. So Lord, I just pray for each person in this room, God, that you would just prepare our hearts for what you have to share with us this morning, that your words would speak clearly to us as we look at your scriptures and we examine what they have to say about your church and your mission for your church. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us. We worship you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in the middle of a series right now, and the series is about discipleship. And uh, the series is called Mission Impossible, but I just want to clear up what that means, okay, from the very beginning, in case this is your first week with us. Mission Impossible equals Jesus' mission to make disciples, Mission impossible equals Jesus' mission to make disciples. So that's how we're referring to the mission in this series. And we've had, this is the third week in this series. And so on week one, Pastor Jerry brought a message and he reminded us of this important truth. And especially if you missed that week, make sure you catch this because really this series builds on the first uh, message in the series. It's that Jesus' mission to make disciples is for every believer. One more time, just focusing on that. Jesus' mission to make disciples is for every believer. It's not limited to a staff and a clergy. It's not li limited to a few, pe a few people with a few special giving giftings. It's not limited to just a few charismatic leaders or speakers. Jesus' mission to make disciples is a mission that he has given every single Believer. So that's the first message that we heard in this series. And then the second message last week, Pastor Jerry shared with us, and he reminded us of this important truth when it comes to discipleship, that we must lay down our life for the mission. We have to lay down our life for the mission. In other words, when Jesus was talking about things in the scripture like, take up your cross and follow me, he wasn't talking about the difficult circumstances we face in life or the challenge that it can be in the morning to get out of bed to read your Bible or something like that. Jesus was talking specifically about the mission to make disciples. In fact, laying down sin, picking up our delight in God and letting him fill our hearts, this is actually all a delight to us. This is not a cost to us. When, we re when I lay down sin, it benefits me. And it benefits other people in my life. And it's a, it's a positive thing. When I'm nice to other people, it benefits me. And it benefits them too, you know? So there's a lot of positive things about this. When I wake up in the morning and I 
open the scriptures and I spend time with God, it's a delight to me. It's a ministry. What a privilege to step into the presence of God and to commune with him. That's not a burden. That's not taking up my cross to follow Jesus. Taking up to my cross to follow Jesus is being on mission for Jesus because while the gospel has been made a free gift in Christ, the call to make disciples according to Jesus is clearly not a costless act. The call to make disciples will cost us our comfort. It will cost us our convenience. It will cost us in our lives. We will have to lay down our lives. And so it really does begin with this. It begins with a, it begins with a belief that I am willing, a conviction really, that I am willing to lay down my life for the advancement of the kingdom through the gospel and through making disciples. And if I reach that point, Pastor Jerry reminded us last week that if I reach that point where I am willing to lay down my life, then what happens in my life is I overcome fear. A great example of this is our military men and women. The way they overcome fear is they reach a point where they're willing to give up their life for the mission. They're willing to lay down their life for their country. So when you face insurmountable odds or difficult circumstances, they're able to respond to those with courage and not to fear, with fear, because they're willing to lay down their life for their mission. And Jesus' call to make disciples beckons us, urges us to lay down our lives for his mission. And if I reach that point where I'm willing to do that, then I'm willing to give up anything else. I'm not afraid of losing things in this world. I'm not afraid of losing my possessions. I'm not afraid afraid of losing my comforts, my conveniences. I'm willing because I've reached a point that I believe the mission is worth my life. And so that was the message last week. And so this one really builds on it, and I felt it important to relay those two summaries uh, before we get into this one because our message this week is Jesus' mission includes a strategy that works. Jesus' mission includes a strategy that works. Now, there's a lot that could be said about the strategy of Jesus. In fact, we could fill a seminar on the strategy of Jesus. In fact, we do fill a seminar on the strategy of Jesus called 401. It's a Friday night and a Saturday morning coming up at the end of this month, and I hope you'll look at that on the Right Now announcement page. So there's a lot that can be said, and we don't even cover it all there. We just cover you know, some foundational principles about the strategy of Jesus when it comes to make disciples. So for our purposes this morning, if we're going to focus not on the practical logistical things, but if we're going to focus on our own hearts and the condition of our hearts towards the mission, I, I was really just praying, what do I need to share? What does God want to speak this morning to us concerning the strategy that he has given his church to make disciples? And I want you to know that the strategy Jesus has given his church to make disciples is this. It's a strategy of multiplication, not addition. Think on that for just a moment, and then I'm going to hopefully unpack that this morning. In fact, uh, there's three ways we're going to unpack it. But let me, let me give you a little story that Jesus told his disciples because he wanted them to grasp this. He wanted them to understand that his strategy was about multiplication, not addition. And so what Jesus did was he told them a parable. He told them a parable about a mustard seed. And he said, a mustard seed is really, really small. It's very, very tiny. But if it's planted and it's given time, it grows, then it grows to be taller than most of the other plants in the garden. And the birds come and they make their nests in its branches. And what he was talking about was he was talking about the advancement of the kingdom of God. His vision for that advancement wasn't that it would just explode during his lifetime, but that it would be planted like a seed. And then that seed would grow and grow and grow and begin to produce fruit for the kingdom of God. So this is the parable he told, and I think by the end of our time today... 
that parable will make a lot of sense in this context. So we're going to look at three things about multiplication. The first one is, why multiplication? That's our first one that we're going to look at. Why did Jesus choose multiplication as the strategy? And then secondly is what multiplication looks like. We do need to get practical in that regard. What does multiplication look like? And then finally, how do we go about multiplying? So those are the three things we're going to address when it comes to the strategy. So I I told you we're going to play a game. And so we're going to do that here in just a second. Uh, And the the purpose of the game is I want to show you why Jesus chose multiplication over addition. So before I do that, let me ask you guys some questions real quick. And if you've seen this before, then, and you have a great memory, don't give away the answer. But I want you to take some guesses at this real quick, okay? Uh, I want to give you two financial scenarios. The first financial scenario is a scenario of addition, okay? Over a 30-day period, let's say that I decided that somehow I all of a sudden, I guess, got money because I couldn't do this right now. But let's say I got money and then I decided that I was going to deposit $10,000 in your bank account every day for 30 days. Now, this one isn't that hard. Could someone tell me how much money you would have at the end of 30 days? 300,000, okay? So that's addition. Every day, adding $10,000 for 30 days equals $300,000. That's how much you would have in your bank account. Now, let me ask you this question, and maybe you can take a guess at this. Instead of giving you $10,000 every day, what if I told you that I would give you a penny on the first day? But every day for 30 days, I would double that penny. So on the second day, you would have two pennies. A lot, right? Well, you'd have $20,000 the other way. On the third day, you would have four pennies, but you'd have $30,000 if you went the other way, okay? How much money do you think you'd have at the end of 30 days? Take a guess. Okay? He said over seven million. Someone else have a guess? Three million? Some of you are math people, so you might be just doing this in your head or calculator. Okay. The guesses I had from people I asked earlier were a lot smaller than that. A lot of people thought, well, maybe 500,000, maybe even a million dollars. The answer is you would have over $5,300,000 at the end of 30 days if you were to double a penny every day. Why did Jesus choose the strategy of multiplication? He chose the strategy of multiplication because it was the most effective way to spread the kingdom of God across the earth. There wasn't a more effective way than multiplication. It starts small like a mustard seed, but it grows. And and the point of this chart is not to say, well, we should reproduce a disciple every single day. I mean, that's that's not, we're going to get into the strategy of what Jesus used and what that involves. The point of this chart is to show you the power of multiplication over addition. When I begin to multiply things and it grows exponentially, when that takes place, it's far more effective than if I just add, 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 add. So Jesus chose a method of multiplication. So here comes our game. I need some volunteers to help me. I actually need three, three volunteers to help me. So Stephen, you seem like a good volunteer. So I'll just call on you. And uh, okay, come on up, Kylie. You're a good volunteer. And uh, maybe someone from this section over here, Jacob, you want to do this, play this game? Come on up, Jacob. Okay, let's give our volunteers a hand. Okay, so now here's what we're going to do. I've got a timer here. Let me get this out. I'm going to give you uh, 30 seconds on this timer. Let me set it to 30. And as I give you 30 seconds on this timer, here's what I want you to do. I want every single person in this room to get a handshake and for you to tell them, good morning. Now, only you three can shake the hands of other people and tell them good morning. Once one of these three people shake your hand and tell you good morning, I'd like you to stand or raise your hand if you're more comfortable doing that, just to indicate that someone has come by to you and they've shaken your hand and they've told you good morning, okay? So the three of you, 30 seconds, we'll see how far you can get, go. Fifteen seconds. We have people in the back too.
five seconds. And that's time. Did we get everyone? Almost. You got pretty close, right? We got pretty close. Okay, let's give those volunteers a hand and they can be seated. Okay, now, now we're going to try this again. I've never done this with a group of people, so this may flop, but we're going to try this again. I thought this would be so cool to do like at an OU football game. It would probably work really well there, okay? So imagine that if this fails, okay? But uh, let's, I'm going to get Amanda up here. So uh, I've already picked on you once, so I'm just going to pick on you again. And Amanda's going to come up. Now, Amanda, I want you to do the exact same thing. We need every person in this room to get a handshake and to say good morning to them, and I want you to beat their time by yourself. But I'm gonna change one rule. Once you give someone a handshake and say good morning to them, they can join your team and start doing it with others. They can go give someone else a handshake and say good morning. Now, Amanda, you may not know this, I chose her, one of the reasons is because she's also an athlete. I, I just have to pick her on her for that. She was a swimmer in college, and so, at Oh, man, USC, right? USC. So, so maybe, that's why she'll, maybe that's why she will win because she's an athlete and she's much faster than these other young people. Or maybe it'll just be, maybe it'll just be the, the change in the strategy. I don't know. But whenever I say go, you can begin. Now, you people out there, make sure you help Amanda win, okay? So ready? 30 seconds, Go. Here they come. <laughs> Here they come. <laughs> you got 10 seconds. <laughs> you got four seconds. Did we get everyone? Give yourselves a hand. Thank you so much. Okay. This is multiplication versus addition, right? And it's also more exciting, don't you agree? I mean, that was a lot more fun. And so multiplication over addition. Jesus chose this strategy because it may start small. It started smaller than sending out three at the beginning. But just in a short amount of time, as we focus on the principle of multiplication rather than addition, it just spreads so much faster. It has so much more energy behind it. This is how Jesus was thinking when he was thinking about the advancement of the kingdom on the earth. It was not by addition. It was by multiplication. I like this quote. This comes from Real Life Ministries and Jim Putman. They say, we cannot divorce Jesus' message from his method and expect to get his results. If we want to see the results of Jesus in the church today, we need to be careful that we don't divorce his method from his message. The message is important. It's vital. I mean, Jesus began to preach it from the beginning of his ministry. In all the gospels, Jesus preached to repent because the kingdom of God was arriving. It was at hand. It was coming. The message is important. But how we go about spreading that message is just as important. And the reality, the truth is that God has called every single convert that comes to know Christ and receives the Holy Spirit to join him in this mission, to multiply the gospel around the earth, not just to add to the message around the earth. So what does multiplication look like? If this is true, hopefully, hopefully you're seeing this, hopefully you're agreeing with this, that this is, the multi, this is Jesus' strategy was multiplication. Let me show you what it looks like, and I want to do a, just a quick case study in the life of Jesus. And let's look at his example of what does it look like. I think to look at an example of what it looks like, we should start by looking at what it doesn't look like. There's a story that happens in John chapter 6, and I'm going to pull up verse 15 here. You can go read the whole story. It's a really interesting story about discipleship. And really through this whole passage, you see that Jesus wasn't supremely focused on just getting as many people to agree with him as possible. He was very focused and intentional on finding disciples who would stay the course with him. He, because he knew his strategy was multiplication, not addition. He needed men and women who would stay the course in making disciples. And so in John 6, 15, uh, there's this verse here that's really interesting. It says, Jesus, 
knowing that they, this is a group of people, a crowd, they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. That was just a couple years ago that I had first realized this passage was in the Bible. The crowds were so enamored by Jesus and what he was doing that they wanted to come and make him king by force. Now, if your goal was addition and you wanted to see as many people circle around you as possible and have influence with as many people as possible, it seems to me that it would make most sense that climbing to a high position like being a government ruler or a king in this, in this time frame would be a really effective way to do that. If you wanted a lot of followers, if you wanted a lot of servants, if you wanted to add to your kingdom, that would be a great way to do that. But Jesus, he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He does reign supremely. But rather than take advantage of this opportunity where the masses wanted to come and make him king by force, he withdrew to a solitary place. How does it say it exactly? He would withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And I just find that very interesting. Jesus had the opportunity to focus on growing the kingdom of God on the earth through addition, through his personal influence with as many people as possible. But he bypassed that opportunity. So how did Jesus focus on multiplication. Well, a lot of us know how Jesus' ministry began, and uh, I want to make sure we summarize the, the first few points. It started with uh, the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, and there was the inauguration of the ministry of Jesus. He was baptized by John. He came up out of the water. The Father spoke and gave his approval uh, for his Son. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove on Jesus, and you have that picture of the harmony of the Trinity and the beginning of Jesus's mission, the beginning of his ministry here on the earth with, and launching into that. So after that, Jesus went to a wilderness. And in that wilderness, he was tempted by the devil. He fasted, and then he was tempted by the devil. When he left the wilderness, he went to an area called Galilee. It was north uh, in, the, in the nation of Israel. He went up to that area. In fact, it had been said of that area that nothing good comes out of Galilee. But Jesus' hometown where he had been raised was around that area in a place called Nazareth. And so uh, Jesus went back to Galilee and he began his ministry. Now right here is where I've noticed that at times there's a lot of confusion in people who have even been in the church a long time about what happens next in Jesus' ministry. And I think a lot of people are under the impression that Jesus then called the 12 disciples to follow him. I think that's the impression that a lot of us have about this. Now, it's true, you can read the beginning of the Gospels, Jesus began to call people to follow him. From the beginning of his ministry, he was extending that invitation. But did you know that some time passed between the beginning of his ministry in Galilee and when he actually affirmed the 12 as the 12 disciples, or he also named them apostles. So there was this gap in time where Jesus arrives in Galilee, and he starts this, this ministry. It says in the scriptures, he went with the power of the Spirit as he went to Galilee. And he went in, and he began this ministry, but there's this short gap in time where Jesus begins this ministry before he focuses on the 12. Well, what was happening during that time? Well, the scriptures give us some insight to that. Jesus began to really be relational with people. He began to really express the love of God to them. First of all, in, in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them start Jesus' time in Galilee in those accounts with him beginning to share about the kingdom of God. And so he went and he started sharing that with people. Well, as he shared people, he met people at their place of work. Remember when he called some of those disciples? What were they doing? They were fishing, right? They were casting those nets. Jesus met them at their place of work, and he began to call them into relationship with him. The Bible talks about people who are uh, possessed by an evil spirit. Jesus ministered to them before he ever called the 12. The Bible talks about people who were sick, and Jesus went and ministered to them before he ever called the 12. The Bible, Bible talks about tax collectors and sinners that Jesus ate with around a table, and he did that before he ever appointed 
the twelve. You see, what Jesus did in the beginning of his ministry because his strategy was multiplication is he began to be relational with people. And and here's how I like to say it. He was relational with an agenda. He had an agenda in these relationships. It wasn't just to be a nice person to these people that he was serving. It wasn't even just to get his message and to create opportunities to preach. His agenda was to find a few that the Father would show him so that he could be in relationship with them and begin the process of multiplication in those few men. Look on the screen or in your Bible with me at Mark 3, 13 through 14. The scripture says that Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed 12 that they might be with him and then he might send them out to preach. I should have included the verse just before this. If you have your Bible, you can look at it. The first thing Jesus does in this story is he prays. He spends some time in prayer with the Father. And then he went to this mountainside and he called a few guys. Now, where did these guys come from? They didn't just appear out of a hat. They didn't just come, come along real quickly, you know, randomly. Jesus had been investing time with these guys for some time up to this point. They had, he had extended an invitation to them that was culturally relevant, and they had embraced that invitation. And as they embraced that invitation, Jesus spent time with them, and eventually the Father showed him a few that he needed to focus his life on helping them grow as disciples of Jesus who could disciple others. One of the coolest organizations that we're connected with as a church is Reaching Souls International. One of the things that I enjoy about going to their banquets is every time I go to their banquets, I get to hear from pastors from Africa who come to America to share what's going on in Africa with people. The gospel is spreading like a wildfire over there in Africa. Uh, Ben, I'll put you on the spot. I should have looked it up. Do you know how many salvation decisions or... close to 11 million salvation decisions this last year in connection with Reaching Souls ministry. And obviously there's more beyond that, but Reaching Souls uh, is, is heavily involved on that continent and in Cuba. And uh, those are the two main, is that correct? And, and so what I love about going to the banquet is I get to hear these guys. And you know, when you hear them come, sometimes it's a newer guy. Sometimes it's a guy who's been around a while. And when I hear those guys who have been around a while, I just see in them this this passion and this fire that what they want more than anything is to see the spread of the gospel. And what you see in those guys, the philosophy of Reaching Souls International is nationals reaching nationals. It's not about sending more and more and more money and people from America, although that can be an aid to the church there, to be sure. But it's about equipping the people on that continent, in those locations, to be equipped to spread the gospel and to see that multiply in Africa. And that's what Reaching Souls is seeing now. They've invested in a strategy that is multiplication, not addition. Had they continued to just go over, make short-term mission trips, come back, and kept the ball in their court, this spread, this advancement of the gospel would have never taken place. It was, it's only possible through the multiplication of disciple makers. It's the only reason why reaching souls is seeing this happen in Africa. Well, Jesus has a similar strategy for his church everywhere. And the strategy that he has for his church everywhere, it will work. The strategy is multiplication over addition. It's every disciple making disciples. It's every person shaking another person's hand. It's seeing it go out and spread as I embrace the call of God on my life to trust in Jesus and to grow to a point where I'm discipling other people. So we see that Jesus called these 12, and I like this, that he might be with them. He called the 12 that he might be with them. Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. And as a man, he was experiencing the full limitations of that humanity. One of those limitations is how much of my life can I share with other people? It's limited. I can't 
be with everyone. I can't spend time with everyone. So Jesus chose a strategy that he modeled for us. That strategy was invest in a few and let them invest in a few and let them invest in a few. This is what we call discipleship. You see, the the scope of discipleship is very narrow. It's not very broad. There's a lot of ways we can minister to other people, and we should. This sermon by no means is intended to tell us that we should not gain influence through serving others and using our gifts and skills to do that. In fact, let's grow the kingdom and let's grow our influence with other people that way. If you're a doctor, be a doctor to the glory of God. If you're a teacher, be a teacher to the glory of God. Whatever role, whatever place you find yourself in, do it to the glory of God, but be relational within that circle of influence with an agenda. An agenda to not only see people added to the kingdom, but to see multiplication take place as you raise up another disciple who can go disciple other people. That's the strategy of Jesus, multiplication over addition. Look at this with me. This is a quote from Scott McKnight. He's the author of the King Jesus Gospel, uh, and I really like this book. He says, so many are obsessed with getting people to make salvation decisions. The disciples were obsessed with making disciples. Now, they were obsessed with making disciples because they were also obsessed with seeing people come to know Christ. They wanted to see the advancement of the kingdom over the earth and people uh, to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Uh, But they believed in the strategy that Jesus gave them. They understood what he had done with them and that in order for it to continue, they had to do it with others. This is Robert Coleman's quote from the Master Plan of Evangelism. He says, Jesus' whole evangelistic strategy, indeed, the fulfillment of his very purpose into I'm sorry, the fulfillment of his very purpose in coming into the world, dying on the cross, and rising from the grave depended on the faithfulness of his chosen disciples to this task of making disciples. It did not matter how small the group was to start with, so long as they reproduced and taught their disciples to reproduce. This was the way his church was to win, through the dedicated lives of those who knew the Savior so well that his spirit and method constrained them to tell others. As simple as it may seem, this was the way the gospel would conquer. He had no other plan. He put all his eggs in that basket. Those 12 men reproducing what he had done with them with others so that the kingdom of God would multiply not just add over the face of the earth. So how does this really relate to you? I'm looking forward to Scott's message because I know he's going to touch on this, but I'm going to hit it briefly. Galatians 2.20 gives us an important insight to how this really relates to me. You see, Jesus wants you to become a Jesus to someone else, okay, not to become God but to become a Jesus to someone else. Or another way that the scriptures say it is Jesus wants to live his life through you. This is what Galatians 2.20 says. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh or in this body, I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Jesus' strategy of multiplication is not just one Jesus, one life, one human on the earth adding to the kingdom. His strategy for multiplication is that when you come to know Christ, that you receive the power of the Holy Spirit so that the life of Christ can be lived through you, so that you can multiply the mission to make disciples, the, the mission to expand the kingdom over all the earth. So that's what Jesus envisioned. So here's some quotes I like that really help us grasp what this means. It had to get small to get big. Jesus' ministry, if he was going to use multiplication, it had to get small to get big. It had to, gr- uh, to grow slow to grow fast. It had to dive deep to spread wide. He reached a few to reach the many. This is Jesus' strategy of multiplication for his church. And so the question really then becomes, are you part of this strategy? Have you been living your life in such a way 
where God is multiplying his kingdom through you, not just adding to it. So that brings us to our last point uh, for this time this morning. How do we go about doing that? I feel like I would be remiss if I led you to a point where you accepted in your heart that you were supposed to multiply the kingdom of God, but I didn't give you any practical advice on how to go about multiplying the kingdom in your own life. So that's, that's what we'll focus on here. So if you want to multiply the kingdom of God, the first thing you need to do is agree with his strategy. Multiplication is greater than addition. Because if you don't agree with that strategy, you're going to structure your whole life differently. If reaching souls didn't have that strategy, they would have structured their whole ministry strategy differently. If they just wanted to go over and see people come to these American preachers and respond to the gospel, they would have had a whole different ministry strategy. But because they wanted to see it multiply, nationals reaching nationals, it impacted their strategy from the very beginning. And that's what has to happen in our lives. Each one of us need to wrestle with God on this. Do I agree that in my life and how I invest in the kingdom of God, that I need to invest first in multiplication, not in addition? If you don't agree with that, then you really can't take any more steps towards multiplication. It stops there. It has to start in your heart. Uh, the way I picture it is like when, John, when Jesus was talking to his disciples in John about the vine and the branches. He is the vine. And when we get to heaven, no one's going to have more fruit than Jesus, and all of our fruit will be his fruit, because he's the vine. No growth, no fruit in the advancement of the kingdom on the earth comes from any other source but Jesus. He is the vine. And so, but we are the branches. Out of that vine, through his strategy, shoots off new branches. And as those van branches come off that vine, they can begin to bear fruit. They can reproduce on that vine. And so I think about all the men and women who have come before me in my line, in my branch of how the gospel has come to me. I can't even see the whole picture between Jesus's life on the earth and now. I don't know all the things that have happened, but I know that the gospel has made it to me. And I know that as the gospel makes it to me, that what I want more than anything is at the end of my life for there to be a branch that I'm part of and that comes out of the ministry that I had in making disciples, and that that branch would continue on beyond my own years on this earth and continue to bear fruit, just like Jesus. Is it not enough to be like our master? Is it not enough to be like our teacher? Couldn't he not ha have had all the accolades in this world? Could he not have used who he was and, and accomplished something that would have caused multitudes to be enamored by him and adore him? He didn't choose that strategy. He chose the strategy of faithfulness to the strategy of the Father that he agreed on from the foundations of the world to see the gospel advance one person at a time through multiplication, not just addition. He limited his own glory, which is far beyond any words that I can use to express his glory. He limited it for the sake of a few, for the sake of the many. That's what Jesus did to see the kingdom grow. So, got to start there. Do I believe multiplication is greater than addition? If so, the next thing I would encourage you is that discipleship is primarily caught, not taught. I can give you some tips today, and I will. I'll give you some direction today for discipleship, but I want you to know that discipleship is primarily caught, not taught. So, in light of this reality, my encouragement to you is if you want to learn to multiply disciples in your life, the best first step I can encourage you to take is to join a small group. Now, this puts some pressure on our small group leaders. Because small group leaders in our church, your job is to model a reproducible process of making disciples for the people in your group. It's not just to be a care group, although I hope you care for each other, but it's to be a discipleship group. It's supposed to be a multiplication group that everything you're doing in the meeting can be used by other people to do that with others. So that we not only engage in spiritual health and growth in our own souls during our time there, but we grow up in maturity in Christ because through our time and group, we have become equipped to be able to disciple another person. 
So my encouragement to you this morning is discipleship is primarily caught, not taught. Go and learn how to make disciples who make disciples in a small group. And if you're in a small group that you don't, you're like, well, I don't understand it, go and ask your leader, how does this work? And if you're a small group leader and you say, well, I hear you, Brandon, and that's what I want, but I don't understand how what I'm doing is accomplishing that, well, then come and visit with me about that. But this is the culture that we're trying to get. Just like, I like, again, Reaching Souls International culture, nationals reaching nationals, multiplication. There's a culture that we're aiming for as a local body, and that culture is multiplication over addition. So if you don't understand it, just ask. Get some help. Ask people, well, how could I begin to go about this if I decided to take what I'm learning in group and multiply it with another person? So, but then, uh, so join a group, and if you join a group, here's what you'll catch. You might catch a stomach bug. Everyone's been catching the stomach bug recently. I don't know. The Redmonds have had stomach bugs. My Catherine has a stomach bug this morning. You might catch that, but I hope you catch something better. I hope you catch these three things. That you catch this in the culture, that there's an intentional leader, that there's a relational environment, and that there's a reproducible process. Every single group has these three elements, or should have these three elements. There's an intentional leader. The intentional leader is a more mature disciple of Jesus. They share the heart of Jesus to multiply the kingdom by making disciples who will make disciples. They're becoming obsessed with it, would be another way, going back to Scott McKnight's quote, they're becoming obsessed with how do I make a disciple who makes disciples. And so get on a journey with them and learn to live your life, to open your life to other people to be relational like Jesus was relational at the beginning of his ministry, but to be relational with an agenda. How can I be relational with these people so that I can connect them to discipleship? And then the second thing is, uh, after an intentional leader, is the relational environment. Um, The relational environment uh, calls us to this. Focus on a few for the sake of the many. Be transparent in your life and open your life up to others and let them open their life up to you so that you can go deep to go wide. Focus on relationships with people like Jesus did with the 12. And then care for the people you're discipling like family because they are family. This week in your small groups, you're gonna be looking at a story where Jesus was really clear about how he saw family. And he had some radical views for his day about family. But they are family. These people that are in your group, that you're discipling, they're family. So care for people that you're discipling like family. And then the last one is a reproducible process. I hope you see this in small group. Here's how the reproducible process works. Um, The reproducible process is we share God's word with others. Because no one becomes a disciple of Jesus just through good relationships. Okay? A disciple of Jesus is someone who receives the teachings of Jesus in their own life, and then they pass those teachings on to another person. You can't become a disciple of Jesus without the teachings of Jesus. So relationships are the foundation or the beginning point. The launching point might be a better way to view that. Uh, but the teachings of Jesus are the substance of our growth in Christ and our acknowledgement of who he is in our lives and leading others to do the same. And so the teachings of Jesus are what we're passing on. So the first thing we do is we share the word with other people. We help them get it into their heads. And if you join a group, you'll see how we do that. The story is told at least three times in every group meeting because we want the word of God to be the foundation for the conversation. We know that it's his word that's gonna transform hearts uh, through the work of his spirit, through his word. And so we wanna get that into their head so we share the word of God with them. And then we lead them on a journey of discovery, discovering who God is, discovering more about themselves, the good, the bad, the ugly. We do it by asking questions and it moves God's word from their head to their heart doesn't require someone to prepare a 30-minute devotion or Bible study or uh, to preach in a small group or anything like that. Once the word is in people's heads, we can ask questions and it moves to their hearts and anyone can learn to do that. It's reproducible. You can learn to share God's word with someone else and you can learn to ask them some questions and let the Holy Spirit work through his word. And then the last, the last one is we move it into our hands. We begin to live life together and practice the things that we are learning together 
always carried on to the point where those I'm investing in, I'm helping them do the same thing with someone else. That's, it. That's when it really reaches its full growth in our hands is when we're passing it on to someone else. That's multiplication, not addition. So short story for me uh, about my life, about how God's used this recently. I went to um, Falls Creek. I've been to Falls Creek with this church six times. You guys familiar with Falls Creek? That's uh, a large, massive youth encampment in Oklahoma, about an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes south of here. And uh, it's a Christian youth camp. And our church goes every year, and they do a great job with evangelism. Um, but I've gone the first five years I went to False Creek, I went with a mindset of addition. So how many kids can I get to go to camp? And then when we're there, how can I best serve those kids to get them to listen? And then hopefully some of those kids hear a gospel message and make a decision. And then we celebrate that and we come home. And then I go, whew, that was great. Ooh, lots of investment there, took a lot of energy and effort on my part. I'm really grateful. I feel good about that, and I move on to the next thing in my life. Well, this last year, for the first time in my whole life, as God's been working this same message in my heart, because uh, this is a change that he's trying to work in me, I decided to go to False Creek with a mindset of multiplication instead of addition. So I went down, and I met five guys while I was there, all of them seniors who had just graduated high school. And I started to build a relationship with them. What did I do? Well, every day when we got together for in-cabin devotional times, I've led many devotional times and family groups in Falls Creek before, but this time I set them in a circle and I began to use this reproducible process. I started to focus on relationships instead of just trying to get out my good little words about how the Bible works and how they should apply it to their life. I started to really care about them as people and wanting to hear how they were processing this and then speaking truth the next day and the next day and sharing life with them. So we sat down and every day I shared a Bible story with them, just like we do in group. And then after I shared the Bible story with them, I asked them questions, just like we do in group. And as I asked them questions, they started to open up. And by day four and five of Falls Creek this year, they were sharing with me deep things that had been happening in their life, some of them that they had never shared with another person before. And after sharing those things with me, there was this bond. I shared with them as well. I was transparent. And this bond began to develop. Well, I asked for all their numbers before we left Falls Creek. And after getting their numbers, I got back and I started a group text chain on my phone with those guys. And I started to invite them and said, I'd like to get together with you guys to keep growing as disciples of Jesus. Would you be interested? Well, out of those five guys, four of the five were available. One guy seems like he would like to be available but just doesn't have it in his work schedule now, but he would like to. The other four were available, and so we set a time. What time? 8.15 on Monday nights. Not the time I would choose for a small group discipleship meeting. It was the only time I could get with these guys. They live very full lives with school and work. So 8.15 on Monday nights. So we set that time aside. They come to my house. We sit in the living room, just a few of us, and then Stephen Dellinger, after we got back, he came and he joined that group with me and began to disciple these guys with me. And then we met this other guy named Matthew Tartza. Matthew Tartza lives right over here at 32nd. Which way am I? This way, 32nd and, uh, and Walker. And, and he lives right over there. And Britt called me one day and he said, there's this kid named Matthew. He goes to Capitol Hill. He's a senior this year. Uh, I need you to pick him up and take him to OCCC for a service project we're doing. So I said, okay, I'll go pick him up. So I pick up Matthew. I ask him questions in the car. I share some of God's word with him. By the end of the night, there's a bond with us because I was relational with an agenda. I could have just picked him up, asked how to pray for him, dropped him off, and said, see you, Matthew. But as soon as I picked up Matthew, my heart, I was going, okay, God, is there something you want me to do here? Is there some kind of discipleship that you want to start? So I, I visit with Matthew. Well, now I'm picking him up. He can't drive yet. And so I pick him up at 745 every Monday night after, uh, to bring him to my house for group. And then we get done around 945 or 10. And I take Matthew home and then go back to my house. And I share life with these guys. And every time we get together, we talk about God's word. It's always the center. It's not just our opinions. It's not just our feelings. It's not just our emotions. Those get included too but it's about the word of God. We get it in our heads first. Then we ask some questions and it moves it from our heads to our hearts. And you know what all these guys already know? If you ask any one of them, 
they know that the reason we're doing this is because God has changed my life and helped me grow as a disciple of Jesus, and that God has put it on my heart to meet with them, to help them become a disciple of Jesus. No secrets. Do they feel ready? No. Do they feel equipped right now? No. Do they feel like they can go and do it? They don't feel that way. But you know what? I just met this Thursday with Isaiah Rosales. He's, he's one of the guys in the group. And as I met with Isaiah, Isaiah told me this Thursday at lunchtime, he said, when I've been battling, you know, feelings of doubt and unbelief, he said, being a part of this has really helped with that. It's really changed the way I'm viewing this. And as we talk about discipleship, Isaiah is ca catching a vision just a little more every week, every day, about adjusting his life to lay it down to disciple someone else. You know what I would call a success, a win, if Isaiah started discipling someone else. If he began to make a disciple who could make a disciple, and it continued on over and over and over again. It's like that mustard seed, you guys. It's one of the smallest of all the seeds. I mean, I think we have a picture of it. It's tiny. It's a tiny, tiny seed. It doesn't start big. It is not glamorous. There's a grind involved. But if it's planted and begins to grow, it becomes taller than most of the other trees in the garden, and the birds come and they make their nests in its branches. If you will be faithful to what God has called you to do, invest in a few for the sake of the many. Go deep so that you can go wide. If you will do what God's called you to do, he will use you to make disciples who can make disciples. It starts with sharing your life with another person, taking on responsibility for their spiritual growth. Would you join me in prayer? I don't think there could be any greater use of our time this morning than if the Holy Spirit began to speak to your heart right now and affirm what he wants to affirm in you regarding the advancement of his kingdom and his strategy of multiplication, understanding that it's not just three or four people giving a handshake, but that, hey, you've received the Holy Spirit. Someone walked up and shook your hand. Now, how are you going to reach out and shake another person's hand? And it doesn't have to be glamorous. In fact, Jesus' strategy was very simple. So Holy Spirit, affirm in our hearts your word. I pray you'd meet each person where they are right now. Lord, in their hearts that you would stir up in them your mission and your strategy for that mission to multiply discipleship, to multiply your kingdom on the earth through relational discipleship, one person at a time. Lord, that we'd be okay with it starting small. It's gonna be messy at times. It's not gonna go well sometimes. Some people are gonna reject us. God, they rejected you. You extended invitations to people like the rich young ruler and said, follow me, and he didn't. God, it's not going to always be easy. But you've given us your Holy Spirit to make us a new creation in Christ so that your life could be lived through us. Lord, I pray for this church at Western Hills, this group of people that is small, in an unlikely area of the city to see your kingdom grow and spread like a wildfire. God, I pray that it would begin in our hearts, in a culture where we all agree together that multiplication is greater than addition, that giving up my life for a few people is worth it because, Jesus, it's enough to be like you. Yes, to use our influence with others, but to focus on a few, to pray and ask you, God, who is it that you're putting in my life that you want me to disciple and lead us to it? 
God, I pray that we would be a support to one another. There's some people in here that you're stirring their hearts to do this, but they're not exactly sure even how to take the right next step. God, I pray that they would join a group and be transparent about what you're stirring in their hearts and that you would use that little community of a small group meeting in someone's living room or in a restaurant or wherever they're gathering to grow and, 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 and just uh, cause maturity in their life so that they begin to understand more and more what it looks like to lay down my life to take on responsibility for another person for their spiritual growth. Not overstepping my bounds, God, we know you bring the growth. Not overstepping my bounds, we know that they have a part, but to do my part with all my heart. God, would you do that? Would you do that work here? God, would you, would you start something right here that leads to 11 million salvation decisions sometime in the future? God, that started way back in, I think, the 80s, Reaching Souls International. Maybe even, I don't know. But many years ago, and, and it's grown like a mustard seed. A small group has grown. God, would you do that right here at Western Hills? Would you give us a vision like that for the advancement of your kingdom through each person individually for as long as we have breath in whatever season of life we find ourselves in? Thank you, God, for your church. Thank you that we don't have to do this alone. It would be way too hard to do this alone. Thank you that we have your Holy Spirit with us, that you promised us as you sent us out on mission, you promised us that you would go with us to the ends of the earth. Thank you that you're with us when we're engaged in the mission. You're always right there in the mission with us. And thank you for your church, your presence with us through your people. Lord, it's not about me. It's not about what I get out of this time. It's about, God, how you want to use me in the lives of others here and how you want to use them in my life to make us more effective for your kingdom. Thank you, God. We worship you this morning. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in this local body as it is in heaven. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to pray for you this morning before we close. Perhaps you need to pray with